even aside from what I just said. Um, I'm going to ask Mihai to just play the tune. I'm sure you all know this tune, which is unusual for a lecture. Uh, let's just hear the tune itself. starts again. I, just before I came out here now, I decided to look at the uh, Coppets Encyclopedia of Chamber Music, which is a, a very old book that is quite revered, and it has analyses of every piece of chamber music up to the time that it was composed. And I found this is the only thing that is said about this movement. This is it, and this is a very exhaustive book. The third movement is a tuneful, expressive cantilena, lyrical in mood throughout, and very delightful. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go a little further into it, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing about this tune is we all know it, I think, and if you don't, you certainly will know it by the time you leave. And it's everywhere. And I was thinking about, I actually was having an earworm with this, you know, which doesn't usually happen. I mean, no lecture could be as different from last week's Beethoven Opus 131 as a lecture on the nocturne of the Borodin. And I was so obsessed with this tune. I went to the dry cleaners to pick up something that I was finally do. And I was hearing the Borodin in full orchestral sound. And it turned out it was actually playing in the dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I looked at the guy. I wanted to tell him about it. He gave me the ticket, I took the dry cleaning, and I'm thinking, he's playing this tune on something, on some device. But anyway, I didn't say anything. You know, it's, it became the Broadway show Kismet, you know, all of these Borodin tunes. But of course, how it became a popular song, I will discuss, because they really change it a lot. Um, and it also was used by Disney, you know, for the little match girl playing straight through. It's used over and over and over. So it, ne it needs a lecture to get it straightened out. I mean, you can't be on Broadway and in Disney and not have a lecture <laughs> at Lincoln Center, I think. Um, so Borodin, you probably know a lot about him, uh, or up to a point. He, he was what we call an amateur composer in that he only wrote when he wasn't feeling well. Uh, people, musicians and his friends, this is a renowned truth uh, about Borodin. If you, almost anything you look up, they tell you this right away his musician friends always said, how are you feeling? I hope not well. <laughs> because if he was well, he was a chemistry professor and before that a doctor and he taught chemistry for years and he loved music. He, you know, he was an illegitimate child of a prince like so many of us. <laughs> and and, uh, and a 24 year, an elderly prince and a 24 year old doctor's wife and so they had to find a dead serf to name him after so that nobody would be upset. And so they picked the dead serf Borodin, and he got the name Borodin. But the prince wanted to make sure he was raised with every luxury, so a lot of money was poured on, th on this guy. And he was brought up by his actual mother and some female relatives, and he was given both a lot of training and opportunity in music and a lot of training and opportunity in science. And as you know, he picked science as his profession. Uh, which sounds very much like what goes on today with a lot of kids in New York. You know, they have to back and forth, science, music, science, music. But anyway, uh, he did play the cello, among other instruments, first the flute, then the cello. And the story goes that he lugged his cello for 10 miles. He had to walk to chamber music rehearsals when he was a teenager because he couldn't afford cab fare, which I don't get with the, uh, with the prince. But anyway, that's the story. But he wasn't the only amateur in the famous Balakirev or Balakirev, depending which dictionary you look in, circle. Uh, this is the group that, is, that in the West we call the Mighty Handful or the Mighty Bunch, and they're referred to as the Five a lot. And that group is also, in Russia, they're just called Balakirev Circle. And they never refer to themselves as anything but Balakirev's group. And Balakirev was a composer who felt very strongly that Russia needed to be Russian and nationalistic musically. It needed to be uh, as Russian, as French music as French, as German music as German, as Spanish music as Spanish, et cetera. You could probably continue that on your own. And basically, uh, that was a new thing. There wasn't much after Glinka, 
was the beginning of it. There wasn't a big following. So Balakira formed this circle and he picked talented, extremely talented amateurs. In other words, people who were making a living at something else. That's all it means. But these were talented, remarkable people. And they were Rimsky Korsakov, who was a naval officer, Mussorgsky, who was in the Imperial Guard, that's two uh, military people, Cesar Cui, and I'll get to him in a second, and Borodin, who was a chemist. <clears throat> so he, Borodin was the only one who wasn't uh, a military person. <coughs> Cui, I saved him for last, because you know, Cui's music is never played, as far as I know. He's completely forgotten. I looked up what his military expertise was, and he was an expert in building walls. <laughs> I just found that out today. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> no wonder we never play his music. But I mean, basically, <laughs> but basically, Cui, the forgotten, who was also a critic, he went around wherever there were military uh, issues um, where Russia needed to protect the army. He built big fortresses and walls and taught how to build walls in uh, the schools, the military schools in Russia. Okay, that's enough about that. I just couldn't believe it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, Balakirev and also um, all of them, Rimsky, Korsakov, and Mussorgsky, they all, except for Borodin, they all disliked chamber music. You won't find a lot of chamber music by anybody of that group except for Borodin, and he not much. Two string quartets and a couple of trifles, because he died at 53, and he was very busy doing chemistry. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look him up as a chemist, you'll see that Borodin actually made some huge contributions to the field of chemistry. So it's rather important, and he's in those books. There's more about him in chemistry books and history of chemistry than there is in the music books, which is remarkable. Um, he also was the first in Russia person of authority in the science community to say that women should study science and medicine. And he helped open the first uh, department in school where women were allowed. And the reasoning of that, uh, if you want to look into his childhood, is he was brought up only by women, and he was taught some science by the wife of a doctor, and so he decided, what's going on here? So that was, all of this is so relevant, the wall, the everything. Okay, <laughs> so, but he loved chamber music, and there were some very big parties that uh, featured chamber music that brought in Rimsky-Korsakov and Glazunov, who was not part of the five, um, and Russian composers who supposedly disliked chamber music liked it when there was a big party and a lot of drink. <laughs> and so there was, a, there was a character named Mitrofan Belyayev. This, you have to remember this. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. But <laughs> Mitrofan Belyayev, his name is important because uh, B is a note, B, Lya is a note, La, and Yev, F. That's, and they wrote pieces, Beliayev, this group of composers, which includes, let's see, uh, the first movement, Rimsky-Korsakov, the second movement, Lyadov, the third movement, a, Spanish, a Spanish serenade by uh, Borodin, and Glazunov, the finale, they wrote together a piece called Beliayev with the theme of B, A, and F. And that was chamber music. It was a string quartet. And Rimsky-Korsakov, who wrote a lot in his diary, recorded what the chamber music evenings of that time in Russia were like. I have to read this to you. <clears throat> I mean, I really do have to read this to you, okay. The music over with, supper was served at one in the morning. The suppers were generous and laced with abundant libations. Occasionally after supper, Glazunov or somebody else played something new of his own on the piano, just composed or arranged for four hands. Adjournment was late, usually at 3 a.m. Some, finding insufficient what they had imbibed at supper, would, after parting with the host at 3, repair, to use a mild term, to a restaurant, quote, to continue. <laughs> at times after supper, during the music making, a bottle or two of champagne appeared on the table and was opened to baptize a new composition. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Not sure. And it gets worse, <laughs> because they got so drunk that they would compose group compositions, and they had to keep doing them when they were sober, and they were, uh, they were amazing, weird compositions, which we still have copies of. The most strange is that the, 
all of these composers together, including Borodin and Rimsky-Korsakov, and Liszt, who was at one of these parties apparently, who loved Borodin's music. They wrote a series of 24 variations and 15 pieces based on chopsticks. <laughs> this is a lot of vodka. And <laughs> ch <laughs> chopsticks here is, but chopsticks in Russia is not, it's this. almost the same. So I looked at this thing. <clears throat> it's, it's huge. And across the top of each line of the score, of each stave, uh, is that, what I just played. And underneath it are these unbelievable variations, pages and pages and pages by, let's see who is involved, Lyadov, Kui, <laughs> Borodin, Rimsky-Korsakov, and Liszt, and others, and what kills me is I actually, I looked, I was gonna play it for you, but you have to go find it yourself now. Rimsky-Korsakov not only wrote a variation uh, on chopsticks, several, but one of them is a fugue using the name B-A-C-H, Bach's name, using that mixed with chopsticks. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't forget he was a naval officer. Now, um, <laughs> One of the things about Rimsky-Korsakov was, though, that unlike the others who refused to study music, and you think, how did he write a refugue if he refused to study? He changed. But for a long time, they refused to study more than play instruments and listen to each other and be told how to write music by uh, Balakirev, who was pushed into that direction by Stasov, who was the one who called them the Mighty Bunch. But he actually was calling Glinka and a few other composers the Mighty Bunch, and then it got name got passed on. But they really felt quite strongly that music shouldn't be too learned because if you study from the books and the teachers, you're gonna write German music. It's gonna sound, it'll be sonatas and fugues and you'll sound like you're imitating Beethoven. So they stayed away from it. But then Rimsky-Korsakov was offered a job at the conservatory and he realized that they might ask him questions, his students might ask him, how do you do this, how do you do that, and he had to know. <laughs> so Rimsky-Korsakov gave up Stasov and all these people and Balakirov, and he went and studied right at the last minute, right one step ahead of the students. Now, of course, he was, a, he was a genius. I mean, he was writing incredible operas and ballets, having hardly studied anything but playing the piano. And this stuff is amazing and very inventive. But what he did study was music that he liked. You know, he studied Liszt, which they all studied, and uh, they passed this on to each other. Borodin was a little different because as a chemist, he studied and visited around Europe. He was everywhere in Europe. Not, the others were not like that. And so he met a lot of musicians because he would study at, the, at, a, at a medical academy or meet with doctors and then he would play chamber music and he heard a lot of music and played a lot of music and his music therefore is quite different from the others. Um, <clears throat> so we heard that tune. Now how can you give an entire lecture on a piece that is very beautiful and simple? I'll tell you. I think it's a great opportunity, especially after a big piece like Opus 131. It's a great opportunity to look at a melody, think about what, what makes it tick, how is it put together, find out who Borodin is musically, because I'm gonna play some other music of Borodin, and see what it is that is different between a very beautiful melody and a pop song, which was based on that melody, and what is the difference between like a simple song and a popular song and a melody in a string chord? These are actually interesting questions. So let's start by hearing uh, the first section, which would be the two um, statements of the theme. This is the actual piece of Borodin.
Okay, and then it's, we'll stop there. Then you're going to hear the tune in the violin exactly the same way with the uh, a, a changed accompaniment, but the tune remains the same. <clears throat> This is a, in case you were wondering, it is actually a love song to, the whole quartet is, the, the description of his uh, marriage for his 20th anniversary to his wife, Ekaterina Protopopova. Um, <laughs> very romantic name, Ekaterina Protopopova. Um, <laughs> and this ends up being a duet. At first the cello states it, then the violin, and eventually it is in canon with the two of them back and forth violin and cello, and then the two violins, which I guess has to do with some affair that I don't know anything about. <laughs> <coughs> but basically, the tune is very simple, but I'd like to start, I'd like to take it apart a little bit because we're gonna get to know it extremely well. <coughs> because what's interesting to me about it is if you listen to a lot of uh, Borodin, I'll play some examples, he has obsessions, many composers do, things that they do over and over. Um, and this has almost all of them. Some of it's in the accompaniment and the harmony and some of it's in the tune. Now the tune, let's just go phrase by phrase. There are four phrases, and this is typical of a lot of melodies you know and love, that there are four little phrases. One, two, three, and four. And then it starts again. Now you notice it didn't end, you know? It doesn't go. It, it doesn't do that. That would be disappointing. At the end we get an ending, but we never get the obvious ending. This is already the difference between like a popular song, which must have an ending. It also doesn't have a B section. It has completely different music that comes in. Uh, in other words, if we call this all the opening theme, the next section is not a B section, or like an inner, vo an inner part to the A. It's just brand new. We'll hear that in a minute. Um, now, harmonically, oh no, uh, before I do harmonically, let's listen to this again, because you have this fourth. That's a fourth. And then another falling fourth here. And this is a fifth. Now these are intervals, very simple, but they are obsessions of his. So most of his tunes outline fourths and then a fifth like this. And at, at the end of the tune it goes and starts again. Not only that, this little, this is a third that has, if you listen to that, then this, this thing coming back up is the same thing going up. Some of this is obvious, but it will get more it won't get complicated, it's just gonna get richer. And then, and now this is the only place that he breaks out of this range, right here. And this is the same as this, which is the same as all little groups of thirds. And then ba da 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 is the same as. So he's, hovering around the same little notes, passing little ideas to each other, it's very organic, in four little phrases. <clears throat> now, important to listen to is also uh, the viola by itself, which I didn't say I was gonna do, but you know, this is not an orchestra, you probably are okay with that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hear the viola alone, please. Um, so let's uh, listen to the viola and see if anything catches your ear, <clears throat> from the, just from the top by yourself. Okay, that's enough. Do, do you, you probably can't miss it. It's descending chromatically. Now, a lot of tunes have this chromatic descending lines like that, you know, every half step going down. But with Bordin, it's an obsession. It is in many, many of his pieces, and it's also something that a lot of the, the Russians liked. And one of the reasons is <clears throat> that there is a naivete in the music that is very charming and very beautiful. And the naivete was because they were trying not to sound German, although he wrote in one of his diaries, I'm afraid that my quartets sound German. Um, and the first one, very Mendelssohnian. But the first one is more intellectual 
in that it's, it's, there's a lot of rigorous complexity. There's a lot less. The second one is just more fluid and, and lyrical. Um, so what we have so far is the descending chromatic line and these little phrases. But we also have, at the beginning, the, the, the tendency for there to be a single note, a pedal, that is repeated, that hangs out. This is also very Borodin. Now before we go on, let's hear a little bit of other music of his, so you'll see what I mean. <clears throat> These are little, from little piano pieces of his. Here's a phrase from a, another nocturno, another nocturne from his Petite Suite for Piano. And listen down here. No, that's the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> but they fit together because not only is the mood the same, but in the bass line you have and you have this. That's a kind of pedal point. It happens to have two notes, but it is a pedal point. So we have both the pedal point and the descending chromatic line, and the harmonies are also descending with that line, of course. And then it does this. All pedal points here. Okay, a little more Borodin. <coughs> Here's a phrase from his uh, serenade from the same thing. It starts with this little uh, pedal point and the bass. several things in there that are in this quartet because he's very obsessed. For example, not only the pedal, but even this, this little, this little thing, it's just a little turn. It's a melodic gesture that is very common. It is in every melody he wrote. Now that doesn't mean you should be mad at him or upset. <laughs> he didn't write a lot. He died at 53 of a heart attack and he was a very busy chemist. So he only wrote a few pieces. But all of them have these same obsessions. Now, in this section, <coughs> we also have, this is exactly as, down, it's down in a different key. Um, it has both the phrase, it has all of that in it with a pedal point in the bass. Now, here's another one. <coughs> this is a, another little board in piece, which has, the, you'll hear this in the middle voice. The chromatic line, and you'll hear that kind of thing. And the tune is basically outlining a fourth, again, just like the other one. Again, over and over, the obsessions are very discreet and, and easy to catch. Now, there's more, <coughs> in case you didn't believe me yet. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, I, what I literally was doing, and I'm using literally the way teenagers do, so I don't know what it means, <laughs> was looking for any piece of Borodin and just seeing if I could find, by flipping through it, every piece I looked at. Okay. So this does speak to perhaps the amateur side of Borodin, because uh, he's obsessed, he repeats himself a lot, he explores the same ideas, but they are beautiful. And as is often said of Borodin, he's probably the only really famous composer with pieces that everyone knows who wrote hardly anything. You know, he wrote so little, but what he wrote 
had all these beautiful aspects to it. So here's another intermezzo of Borodin, where we have the fourth and the fifth and a few other of these things, like the chromatic lines. Oh, sorry. And you have the fourth, and then the fifth. And again, another fourth, and another fourth. And then here, too, doesn't it sound familiar? Um, so even those little gestures are everywhere. Let's see, do I have more? Hmm. OK, this is not by Borodin, but it's called Borodin. It's by Ravel. Do you know this little thing? Ravel. Uh, did something that I can identify with. Uh, he, for fun, occasionally wrote pieces in homage of other composers. And <coughs> there's one which uh, is a, sm a small movement. In the st it's not in the style, in the manner. He calls it in the manner of Borodin. And I'll just quote one passage which has both a pedal point, an unmoving note, and a chromatic line in the top. You get the idea that when he's thinking of Borodin, Ravel, very sharp ears, and really good socks that he made himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I just, I, I mean, it, it's free associating, but really he did. Um, <coughs> he was focusing in this little piece on Borodin on the pedal point and the chromatic line. <clears throat> now, moving forward. Okay, before I do too much with it, Let's get back to the actual piece. So now, going section by section, I'll, I'll tell you what the, how the whole piece lays out. It's not really sonata form, but it's close. And remember I said there is no such thing as sonata form, so it might as well be sonata form. In other words, there's a beautiful melody, you hear it twice. We can call that group one. Calling things in groups was an idea of, a, of Tovey, who was a famous uh, musicologist and one of the first theorists to analyze structures the way we do now. And he would call it a group. Group one is in the, in the key of the piece, tonic key. Group two is something else. And in this case, group two sounds like a long transition. It's got two ideas. Let's skip to group two for a moment, which is bar. Well, you probably know. It's the Pumoso. And what you're going to hear is uh, a scale passage, which is one motif, and uh, then a little trill descending pass. So you have a scale going up and then a little passage going down. And those are the two ideas of this passage. <coughs> And that, that is very simple, obviously. It continually is changing key. So it's transitional. Uh, a transition, normally in music, is thought of as anything that is changing key that is not a development of the main idea. And it's a transition. We can't find the main idea. The main tune is not there. It has two other motifs. They're not uh, compelling as melody, which he obviously can write. They're just motifs from moving from key to key. You've got the scale with the sforzando going up, and then you have I'm coming down. So that's all he has for that section. So the structure of the piece is this, the tune twice, once in the cello, once in the violin. This passage you just heard, which we could call group two, or you could call it a transition. You could call it section B, 1A. It doesn't really matter. OK, so the next section. 
Fred. <laughs> I remember when I was a young student in my first years at Juilliard, I always said things like Fred. Well, what do you call that? I'm calling it Fred. And, uh, you know, that's why I've always been nice when I taught later to wise guys. Okay. <laughs> so then after, after that section, we have a, a development. And the development is very interesting because Borodin makes a, a very conscious decision. And his, his composing, because there's a, a naivete about it, it is easy to tell. This was a conscious decision to do this. With Beethoven, it's really complex to figure out what was he thinking, how did he know this, he knew everything, what level is he, the, you know, it's complex. Uh, with Mozart, too, you, what's conscious, what's, it all runs together. You know, he knew everything, but it was in the sound of the music. With Borodin, it's much simpler. Because he's thinking, I can't repeat the whole melody. That won't be a development. But I like the melody. <laughs> what do I do? <clears throat> so he thought, I'll shorten the melody. It's got four phrases. I'll just take one out. That's a good idea. But he does more than that. But that's the main thing he does. It's a little odd. Can we hear the cello at, uh, just the cello at first, at um, whatever bar, we, let's see, what is that? Yeah, 67. Something missing? Play, play it one more time. I just played what was cut out, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so he does, first what he does is just cuts out C. A, phrase A, phrase B, phrase C, phrase D. Now this proves that he was thinking of four little phrases and he was conscious of them because he took one out, not just once. Every single time the theme appears in the development, it is missing phrase C. Okay, that's something that means that you have an awareness that it, because it's a strange little thing to do. Okay, then, the other possibility, which is more sophisticated to do and never occurs in, uh, at least I don't think so, in any pop music, is that you alter the theme in harmonic ways uh, that changes the melody itself. So, for example, let's do one of those. <coughs> well, actually, we already did one of those because um, the tune that he just played should do this. But he played, because Borodin wrote this. Did you notice that? You probably did, but you, if you didn't, let's hear that again. It should be this. And now play what it says. Ah, so he's changed it harmonically and he's removed C. These are deliberate things. And it, it's interesting if one were studying composition to look at Borodin because you can see very clear techniques. And I have applied them to many little melodies and I'll show you that you can have some fun with that in a minute. Um, now let's hear that section with the harmony so we can hear how much the harmony has changed uh, with, with that new tune. Aha, okay, good. See, you see, what happened was <clears throat> you get the tune with the phrase removed and the slightly changed intervals, and then the viola brings in the transition material. So the development section is a very deliberate, self-conscious, but beautifully carried out concept, which is he will keep repeating in different keys with different harmonic contexts the tune with phrase C removed. I mean, this is a chemist, right? So he's probably said, I know what I'll do. I will take, I have to use the right accent. <laughs> he's like, he's like, so what, he, okay, so I'll take this tune <clears throat> and I will, I have phrase A, B, C, D. I'll take out phrase C. Put it here for later. In this column here, push away. Then A, B, D. But I change interval here and interval here and harmony like this and then I take the theme from the transition and link to the next one, it will happen again. 
OK, so that's exactly what he does. Then he goes to the key of F minor, which uh, we haven't heard from. And F minor, you hear this kind of thing in music analysis. F minor is so far away from A major, it's really amazing. It bothers people, I know, if you're not a musician. What do you mean it's far away? It's like, here, here's A major. It's like, you don't even have to move. It's like right there. It has to do with how many notes are changed from key to key, how many flats are added or how many sharps are added. That's what far away means. Musi the musicologist Tovey, uh, who was brilliant in many ways, was also strangely naive, maybe because he, nobody ar ever argued with him because nobody was doing what he was doing. He was one of these people who said, this key is considered far away by other musicians, but I don't know what they're talking about. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, so um, let's hear this version of the tune in F minor, which begins, well, just where we stopped. 79, 79 yeah. <coughs> Okay, and then he's going to do it again. Now, we've, uh, in a different key and a different mood. That, that was very different. Now, in that one, <clears throat> I think I need the score for that. <clears throat> in that one, we're in F minor. But what's beautiful and strange about it is that uh, when the tune, when we've heard the tune so far, the first note is the note of the key and the chord under it. And later on, too, with the cello, it starts on C. This one, you would think it would be this, but it's not. It's so what he's done is he takes the note and changes the harmony so it is not the root. It's the third of the chord, and it's minor. So the whole feeling is different. And this is pretty sophisticated. Uh, the harmonic palette, the tone and the feeling of it is completely and utterly changed and he's allowing notes to have different meaning in the context by doing that. So this is now a seventh. And this is actually fairly dissonant uh, in his style. It, it's not terribly dissonant for the time, but it, it is a kind of dissonance that was modern in a way because it, it, it changed the uh, way you listen to a melody by something completely surprising, and it's a little shocking. But it, it's also a uh, piano, which helps, and he keeps the harmony just repeated like this because he knows he's doing something unusual, so he draws your attention only to that by doing this. Because before we had syncopation, da 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 da, or we had triplets, we have all these different kinds of accompaniments. Here, it's the simplest kind because the harmonic placement of the tune is unusual. And again, now here the tune is like what he did, it's the wrong interval. And then, in, <coughs> um, in, he skips this, right? And then it should be, but he skips that and instead of going, he goes, all right? Um, and then we get to the next thing. So that is an increase in structural dissonance. And he would have understood that he's a chemist. You know, he's actually, it's getting tenser. Uh, so he's removed C. He's changed a few intervals, and now he's changing the harmonic context even more. And then at the end of the phrase, he transposes it and goes into a completely unexpected key because the shape of it, instead of going, um, that only takes the upward direction, and it's a complete shock. I mean, you, you could take. Uh, you could do anything with that shape. It's so clear now.
I'm just screwing around, but basically, <laughs> thank you. No, but, but basically, if you allow uh, the harmony to guide the shape and you don't care anymore uh, about which intervals, you only care about the shape of the line so that you can recognize it. That's, that's actually what development tends to be in all music. It tends to be holding on to a simple identity while the context becomes more complex, which is exactly what he's doing. So then we get it in the viola. And I have to say something I forgot, but the word viola reminded me. <coughs> Beliayev, remember him? <laughs> Beliayev was, he had two uh, occupations. His primary, uh, his job was that he was a timber merchant and he was one of the most uh, wealthiest timber merchants and wealthiest people in Russia at the time. And people came to his house for chamber music and guess what he played? Viola! He played viola in the chamber music. And we don't know whether he got the idea for the timber first <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that guy's been around for hundreds of years and nobody's ever said that, but I, it's probably true. It's probably timber then viola, not viola then timber. <laughs> Unless they decided, you know, the rest of the quartet said viola, timber, stick to, <laughs> stick to timber. You know, okay. <clears throat> and what's the difference between a violist and a timber merchant? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, sorry. <laughs> okay. So let's hear the viola version with accompaniment. Oh, but before we do, take, start at 80 so we can hear how the second violin now is given the task is of the transition in the scale to bring the new harmonic idea to the violist. <laughs> Aha, you see? So it's even shorter, it's even more surprising, and it has more changes. So they're getting more and more unusual. And then uh, the last one, which we just stopped, uh, we're, that we're about to get to, is in the cello. Let's, go, let's back up to um, uh, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, which has the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, so now it's not even a complete phrase. He has taken out D too, so we have A, B, and that's it, no D. Instead, we move into this thing. So it's very easy to listen to this, and the more you think about it, uh, knowing that, the clearer it is. Now, it's not over. Uh, we have more examples of this, but eventually we get back to the main theme. And when we get back to the main theme, we have a dialogue between the cello and the violin, which supposedly, according to his earliest biographer, represents himself and his wife. His earliest biographer knew the family very well. And um, so it's probably true. Uh, and he even knew Borodin's uh, parents. So um, let's start at the tempo one with the duet and everybody else. <coughs> Now, by the way, what they're doing is extremely accurate to the score because very often when people play this, the violin plays as loud as the cello and they're just a, in a dialogue, but actually it's marked softer and it's, a, it's an echo. So it, the, whether the story is true, it doesn't make any difference. For Borodin didn't want them both to be, he maybe he thought it was too obvious. So this is written pianissimo and that's written piano. So that's, that it's a beautiful sound. Now, before we get back to the piece, I did a few experiments with you, for you. Um, one of the things, the, cr the, the chromatic line that goes down like this, let's say. There are techniques that composers used uh, to get those things with harmony. And one of them is very simple. Uh, if you take dominant seventh chords, you know, in, if you're in a key of C, the dominant seventh is, it's, a, it's the, uh, the chord that leads to the final moment. If you take a series of dominant <coughs> seven chords and you put them in inversions like this, this is called six five, and then you go down 
and you do 4 2. In other words, if you alternate these two inversions and you go down, and then the next one, and the next one, and then the next one will be. In other words, it's possible to have a chromatic scale going down by alternating different dominant sevenths. And what you get on the top is the, a whole tone scale. It's very interesting. And, uh, you know, composers used it a lot in the 19th century, and Russians loved it. Uh, Mozart used it a little bit too. So here, if you listen to the bass here, I mean, the lowest, I'll tune it down here. So what you get on the top is a whole tone, and what you get on the bottom is chromatic. Do it again. There's a spot in the piece where he does do that. If you could start at, he doesn't do it completely, but he does it for a while. If you start at 38, it's a weird place to stop, start, but it's happening in the cello and you can hear the chord progression, which it does it for a little bit and then it goes away. <coughs> Okay, and then the last one, the last chord was, instead of doing what I was talking about, he just changes the, the quality of the chord. Qu quality is used to mean the difference between D major and D minor. That's all. So, but he was doing that progression, which again is something he might have observed in German music or maybe when he was uh, in Heidelberg, which he spent some time playing music, and someone said, you know, if you're composing, all you have to do is take the seventh chords and drop them like this. And he said, oh, well, I, I will try that. No, well, never mind. Okay, <laughs> getting confused. Um, so, <clears throat> I said there was no B section. In other words, a, a lot of most popular tunes and all Broadway shows and every song by Gershwin and every song by Cole Porter and Harold Arnold, all those people, they have B sections. They have a main tune, which is the part most people know, then there's the B section, which a lot of people forget. And then there's usually an introduction, which everybody forgets. <coughs> so um, let's take Happy Birthday because that's the most obvious tune. I'm going to do a few things here. I'm going to put a B section to Happy Birthday. Now, it's going to be disturbing. I, I warn you. <laughs> okay. <coughs> if you don't like it, write your own B section. Now, and a, a, B, a B section is defined as simpler than not as important, and it has to get back, bring you back harmonically so you can start over. So it always ends on a dominant and it goes back to the beginning. So here's Happy Birthday in its simplest form. Here's a B possible B section. That's, it doesn't have that, and if it did, it would be even worse in restaurants than it is now. <laughs> <coughs> now, if you wanted to have a chromatic scale to happy birthday, you could. It can happen. Uh, now, a couple of other things here. <clears throat> By the way, Happy Birthday has four, um, four little things too. Da -da -da -da. One, two, three. Oops, <laughs> you know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, let's see. Oh, here we go. I'm going to find this in a moment. Okay, now another tune that has four short phrases is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. <clears throat> so, one, two, 
three, and four. And it's simpler than the Borodin <coughs> because it only has, two, it's more like happy birthday, only it's a little more complex than happy, uh, maybe complex isn't the word, it's a little more interesting. Because happy birthday goes da da dum da da dum da da dum 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 da da dum 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 And that dum dum though, what's good about it is it's an appoggiatura. It's the only note that causes some uh, dissonance. It's almost like Wagner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this this one has two rhythms, dum dum and dum da ka dum dum, and this and the cute part is that uh, at the end it goes dum da ka dum 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 instead of dum dum da da ka dum dum. Okay, that's not really important, but. Uh, let's take some Borodin lessons uh, with, with, this, with this tune. There you are. Okay. So first I'm going to play this for you so that you can hear uh, a pedal tone, a note that doesn't change very much. It will eventually move. And chromatic lines. The first chromatic line is here. And then here. the chromatic line a little more. Now, listen carefully. What did I do here? removed C, right? That's what Borodin did. It's a little weird. <laughs> it's missing. And by the way, it's exactly the same interval. Isn't that strange? Uh, maybe not. The third phrase has the same exact shape and interval as the Borodin. Um, maybe that's why I thought of it, but I don't know for sure. Now, uh, if we put, you know, the Borodin is um, in 3-4 and Over the Rainbow is in 4-4. Four, four. That's important in a moment. So here I took the accompaniment that actually Borodin wrote, but I put it in 4-4 four, four time and I'm taking Over the Rainbow. It fits pretty well. In fact, before I do it, let's hear it in 3-4 time. Can you guys just play that, please? <clears throat> Okay, yeah, right. They fit together pretty well, don't they? <laughs> okay, but here, here it is uh, in 4-4 four, four times so you can actually play the whole tune. in tune with that accompaniment because the accompaniment is, I mean, even though the chords could be written by Harold Arlen, he wouldn't do that. And it fits perfectly with Borden. Now here it is with C removed. 
and not just C removed, I'm doing a development section version. Let's say that the tune over the rainbow was in being used by Borodin in the development section. He would take out the C section and change the harmony with the way we talked about, and it would probably end up like this. So that, that's, uh, it's a little disturbing when you know the tune, but that's the point, is that in the context of the piece, that love song is also shortened, revised, harmonically changed, so it is a little disturbing. And the same thing would happen if we did it to that. <coughs> uh, by the way, doing things to Borodin's music uh, is a big tradition. I looked it up uh, very easy. I just Googled uh, the Notturno tune. There are arrangements for every single instrument as a soloist with piano, many instruments as solo with string orchestra or with full orchestra. Um, and there's a saxophone quartet arrangement, there's a wind quintet arrangement, uh, all kinds of, what, do you know that? Have you heard that one? Oh, okay. <laughs> all, all kinds of weird arrangements like that. But probably the strangest one is, and the most well-known, is what happened to it in the Broadway show Kismet. Now, if you don't know Kismet, uh, fine. It was a big hit of a Broadway show. Every melody in the show is by Borodin. Um, they were all changed in some interesting way. So now you know a lot about melody writing and structure. Let's say you're a composer. Now, these guys who did this, not, forget whether you like it or not. It's not even, and you might, and, uh, and uh, there are admirable things about it. They knew what they were doing. This is very deliberate, conscious uh, compositional technique applied very well. So the first thing they said was, it's in 3-4. I don't think a pop tune is going to be hit in 3-4. It's going to be in 4-4. Okay. Then it's being sung. So we need more time for the singers to hold their notes. Because this, if you do it the way the cello does, you, can you play the, the theme the way it's written for a moment? If you think of singers, it's actually difficult. <coughs> Now, when I say it's not hard to sing, by difficult, I mean if you want to put over a song in a Broadway show, you need time to show off your voice in a different way than that does. 4-4 four, four also helps you do it. Now, I had an experience. This is just a little anecdote, but it's true. Uh, I, years ago, I, I had an opera done at the 92nd Street Y, and I was at a rehearsal, and behind me, um, the baritone who was the star of the opera, and his agent were sitting behind me in the dark in the theater, not knowing that I was in front of them. <laughs> and she said to him, look, hold those high notes as long as you want. She said, I don't care what the conductor says at all. And he said, but they said I'm holding them to it. She said, it's a great sound. Just stay there. They'll wait for you. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that, but you know, so. <clears throat> So let's take a look at what, uh, in the time that we've got, what they did to write, to write the um, tune. First of all, it's in 4-4, four, four, as I said. But if you were, uh, knowing what you know now, what the board thing doesn't have is a B section. You have to write a B section. It also doesn't have something else. It doesn't have a climax in the tune. It doesn't have a big ending. So you're a Broadway composer, and you want to hit 4-4 four, four time, B section, climactic ending, okay? Those are the three things that it doesn't have. It's a, it's a piece of classical music. It doesn't need the big blockbuster ending because it's a beautiful, delicate, subtle ending. We don't need that beautiful, delicate, subtle. What? I'm not putting money in that. <laughs> okay, so here, here's the tune in 4-4. Four, four. just like it does. And they write a little counterpoint. If you actually hear the recording, they're all singing in counterpoint all the time. Good counterpoint uh, 
is musical decision. The counterpoint that they wrote is perfectly acceptable, but it's a little hysterical because there are four people, yeah, four, three or four people singing different things all the time in order to simulate opera. In other words, we only have two and a half minutes we've got in this song, or three minutes, we've got to get a lot going on so people think it's operatic. But anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll bring out some of the other lines now. Now we have it in 4-4, four, four, which gives it mm, ba, mm, ba, mm, which is you know, easier to remember and easier to sing. Also, the notes are longer. The long notes are much longer. That's just what the baritone required, right? Instead of it's note is twice or three times as long, all the whole notes, okay? Now, we need a B section. How do you write a B section? I'm going to tell you. It's really easy. You can all write B sections after this. <coughs> C sections, that's a hard thing. <coughs> they say that people who've had C sections can't write B sections. It's been disproved. Okay. <coughs> but not covered. Okay. So the tune is a pre-existing condition. <laughs> the, the B section, <laughs> they've done a minor surgery to put it in 4-4, four, four, and now they need a B section. So this is how you write a B section. You look at the tune, and you listen to a phrase in the tune. It ends like this. And this is my beloved, right? And this is my, let's take that. And this is my, and then we go, this is the B section. And then and do it again up a key. And now we get to the return, but it's up too high. And believe it, this is very clever. I mean, these guys knew what they were doing. They put this up here, and then they slide into the tune where the original tune with a new harmony. That's where it's supposed to be. And then they finish it. But we need a big ending still, so listen carefully. Instead of, it goes, okay, it has to go up. And it has, to, it has to have a new harmony. And then a diminished chord, whenever you're stuck. <laughs> and even when you're not. And this is my beloved. You have to, have to end it. That never happens in the quartet. They end, they end it. It's a beautiful, subtle ending passing from instrument to instrument and it disappears, it's gorgeous. So if you want to make a, a big hit out of a beautiful melody from the classical piece, make sure it's in 4-4, stretch out the long notes, put in a B section, add a high note right before the end, and make sure that there's a strong cadence. There you go. Okay, don't tell me, don't, you don't say you didn't learn how to make any money in this class. <laughs> okay, so I think we are ready to actually hear the piece. Um, Remember now, it's a really complex, impossible to understand piece of music. <laughs> this is only one movement of this piece, but it's probably one of the most famous tunes. I just have to say one last thing. When I Googled it, aside from all those arrangements, it is included under the 50 most important classical pieces of music, this tune, uh, the 25 most essential listening items, um, the 10 best slow melodies. It's hilarious. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Whenever something's the best, you gotta wonder. <laughs> 